Well, I'd like to announce our next keynote speakers. We have Carrie Don Clark, an engineering manager at Google, and also Google senior staff developer advocate, Reza Rockney. So hi, I'm Kerry, and something I learned long ago is when you have a slide and a talk, try to make one point that the audience will remember. So the one thing I want you to remember about me is that though this is my real job now, my real job previously was lifting, throwing, and most importantly, catching other humans as a circus instructor and performer. And I'm gonna try and sneak in a second point. We'll see how good your memory is at the end. Also, uh, if you wonder, why does Kerry seem ever distracted, tired, or like he's lost his train of thought? It's because at my home in North Carolina, I have six children, and this is probably the last time I could lift all of them, but hopefully next Beam Summit, I'm raising the slide from last Beam Summit, next Beam Summit, I hope to have either a picture of them all lifting me or something a little more updated. Thanks, Gary, um, and I'm Reza. I don't have exciting pictures to share. And I was thinking about uh, Kerry's one, and I suspect if I even attempted something like that, I'd be spending a few days in A&E. Um, so we'll stick with the, uh, the straightforward one. Uh, I uh, uh, do various roles in Google, um, in this particular case around ML. I'm doing a lot of the requirements that the good folks like Kerry and a few folks around here have been building. Um, so for the session today, uh, we are mainly going to be talking about run inference, uh, which is this idea of a use case encapsulated within a transform. And you just pass in configuration rather than writing code. And Kerry's going to be doing uh, the bulk of that piece. Um, but before we get there, I just wanted to go through a little bit around, you know, why do we think Beam needs these kind of transformations where um, you're doing the whole end-to-end -end use case? And building it and just passing in configuration. So uh, we, you know, this can be called like turnkey solutions. Um, and uh, going back, beginning of last year when we started this, um, you know, there was a, a little bit of a pushback on the whole idea because you know, Beam has these amazing primitives that can allow you to be super expressive when you're building batch or streaming pipelines. And based on the last uh, uh, talk, talk. Of course, you could build some very complex things, maybe too complex sometimes. Um, the problem that we've often heard about from the community and folks who come to use Beam is that it can, unfortunately, have a bit of a steep learning curve. So for example, imagine you're a developer, your manager has just told you that by next Friday, you've got to build something in this technology called Beam, you've not used it before, um, and you've just got to get it done. When you start out, you've got to go through a bit of a hard start to get things going, to be able to land that thing on Friday. Essentially, with all these wonderful primitives, with Beam, you're getting lots of Lego blocks. You've been asked to build the car at the end, and you don't get any instructions on how to get there. Now, my daughter did this, and she's, uh, she was very proud that daddy's putting something on, about her on, on the slides. And she had a lot of fun doing it. You know, I'm hoping she's going to be an engineer at some point. Um, you know, she did lots of experimentation. She played around. But that developer who needs to land something by next Friday, they just need to get their thing done. So how can we help them? Something that we tried like a few years ago that does help is we added things like patterns into the Apache Beam documentation. So what are patterns? They allow point solutions to be expressed with code. The user then goes there and copies that code and then can get going. They kind of get to what we need, but not 100%. One of the problems is that patterns tend to be point solutions. And when that thing that you need to build by Friday is a full end-to-end -end use case, you'll need a bunch of patterns. So again, we're back to which set of patterns can I use to solve this problem? Another issue with them is, things change. So for example, for the, those uh, who've been playing around with the Python Beam, um, you know, we have shared.py, there's a new version of that coming. How do you know about that new version? Well, you can either try and keep up to date with all of these things, um, uh, and if you do, then you've got to go and change your code base to be able to make use of them. Finally, what we notice about these kind of use cases is a huge amount of the code is boilerplate and completely generic, not specific to the domain that you're in. 
So what does that mean? Let's imagine there are four organizations who need to use a machine learning model within their pipeline. What we're asking people to do is literally copy the same code in four different places. Each one of these organizations then needs to write unit tests. Each one of these organizations then needs to document, because we all document our code, right? Um, and they also then need to upkeep it. So the idea was, why don't we make this all easier for folks by building these transformations that encapsulate the entire problem in a single line of code and that variability that comes from the domain, so the thing that is different between those organizations, we just pass in as configuration. This helps address the ease of use because now it's the simple, this is, this is not particularly pseudocode and you'll see that in some of the demos uh, that Kerry will do in a moment. The other uh, advantage uh, of these kind of patterns is that runners can now understand the intent of the user. So while no runner right now is doing it, in the future we're hoping that some runners will be able to understand that, for example, this is an inference that's being run and you're asking for GPUs. So we can do smart things at the runner side to make things more efficient. So why uh, run inference? Uh, in, you know, in terms of these kind of transforms, we could have built time series, we could have built industry-specific use cases. Well, ML and Beam kind of are starting to go together here. We have quite a lot of examples of use cases where customers are using uh, Beam directly, um, and also great community engagement. These are the talks from last year's Beam Summit. A huge number of them are ML. And we actually firmly believe that, you know, as time moves on, a large number of folks using Beam will be in the context of ML. Now, whether that's using models within inference so that you can bring your operational systems nearer to your analytical systems, or whether it's pre-processing data, getting it ready for training. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Kerry, who's going to talk a lot of detail about run inference. So as Reza said, we are trying to move from a pattern that you have to implement to something that implements most of the aspects of that pattern for you, freeing you to write the code that is important to you and your use case. We launched last year at Beam Summit our Run Inference Transform, our approach to giving a generic interface to any model inference on Apache Beam. Now, we were motivated by trying to make this simple, easy, and correct. So one of our major objectives is to remove the boilerplate code you would have to write if you were doing an ML inference pipeline without run inference. So an ML pipeline will often look like this to begin with. Of course, you have to read from a data source. We can't really help you more with that yet. But then once you have your data, you often need to pre-process it. You need to resize, pad, tokenize, etc., before you can give input to your model. Then you have to actually do your inference. And without run inference, you have to write your own custom do fund to do this. This is already opening the door to pitfalls. Not only do you have to write something, but by doing so, you could misimplement a pattern or introduce bugs or forget critical functionality. So a good example is load your model in setup so that you only load it once. If by mistake you load your model over here in your process function, you are going to melt your GPU by trying to load the model for every element. So, this is something that we can make sure is done correctly. Also, once you have your model, you may learn that some inputs, in spite of your preprocessing, throw errors. Now you have to catch those exceptions and handle the errors. Oh, also you probably care about performance. So you want to know what's your latency, what's your throughput for your model. Also, your model needs batched inputs, and tuning that batching is very important to your performance. Finally, your model also has configuration you need to pass in. 
So here you're having to do more and more and more repetitive tasks to provide basic functionality. So what we are trying to do as a community is to make this easy, straightforward, and correct. Here with run inference and a model handler, you get all of that functionality at your fingertips without having to write your own code. Of course, here, if a problem is found or new capabilities are added, they're available to everyone at the same time instead of just in your code base. Now, I talked a little bit about uh, run inference taking a model handler there. Because run inference is a generic interface, it can take a model handler that knows how to use a particular framework for a particular kind of inference. So for example, here, we're showing the PyTorch model handler tensor. So it's a PyTorch model, and it expects a tensor input. Uh, not all model handlers have that, that type. If they only take one type, we feel free to elide it. We have right now these six different model handlers. And if your favorite framework isn't here, we encourage contributions. In fact, since the last Beam Summit, we have now XGBoost, TensorRT, and Onyx model handlers. And the Onyx model handler was a, con a community contribution. Uh, Onyx, if you're unfamiliar with it, is a uh, standard that you can compile models from other frameworks into. So that dramatically expands the capabilities of run inference. Now, of course, you might want to know where are good examples of how to actually run inference for different use cases with these different model handlers. So also, since the last Beam Summit, we have added to the Beam repository numerous notebooks that you can run easily on Google Colab or on your local machine. And these are grouped by what you're trying to do with your inference. So we have example of prediction and inference with pre-trained models, custom inference with a, a model that's not something we have a pre-made model handler for, automatic model refresh, which we'll talk about in a little bit, multi-model pipelines, where things start to get quite interesting and showcase the power of Beam, model evaluation, which we'll also talk about later, and of course, data processing, which is key to any machine learning pipeline. So now I have a demo for you of one of these notebooks. And we've talked a lot in the news, in the media, in our life with our families about large language models. So this is a notebook showing a smallish uh, T5 or Flan T5 small large language model in a beam pipeline. And less than the code, what I want you to take away from this is more how easy this is compared to writing the whole thing yourself in a custom do fun. So we begin by, of course, importing everything we need. Something I'd like to call out with this example is that we are using the Hugging Face Transformers library. This is very powerful. And if you wish to use the Hugging, Force, Hugging Face Transformers library models, you can do so today using our PyTorch model handler. It's, I've got to say from my own experience, the easiest way to get up and running with a machine learning inference pipeline. So we set some configuration. We make sure that we have our model. We know where it's going to be. Then our actual code. It's as easy as using this auto model function to pull the whole model from Hugging Face into your local environment. We set it up, save it. Then we define some functions for our pre-processing and post-processing. Here we're tokenizing the input, and then we're going from tokens back to normal language. Finally, we show that you can also get that tokenizer from the Transformers package. So you don't have to write your own tokenizer. And often this is uh, paired. You, when you look at the model, it will tell you which tokenizer the model expects. Finally, we instantiate the model handler. To make the model handler, we have to say, where is the model? We have to give the model config. Again, come straight from the Transformers package. 
we pass the model specific parameters, and finally, we say what is the inference function for this model. You may have different choices within one framework. For what do we actually call the inference function? We allow you to pass that in so that you can use numerous different inference functions within, say, the PyTorch framework. Finally, the good stuff, the pipeline. So we're saying to the model, translate this sentence from English to Spanish. That's our input. Our pipeline is as simple as create the example or read the input, tokenize it, run inference, get the inference output, detokenize it, and print. And now I make my prayer to the live demo gods. So we have English to Spanish, but well, let's see if this will really work. Can we change that to French? Thank goodness they're discarding my unparsable args for me. And voila. Indeed, we can change this. Um, thank you very much. I tried to do Japanese, but the uh, small model does not like my Japanese input. So back to our presentation. So another thing we're trying to do is make this even one step easier. So some model zoos, Hugging Basin is, is an example, and TensorFlow Hub is an example, host these pre-trained models. And we thought, can we take those configuration steps that I showed you, the tokenizer steps, and make them more integrated so that when you write your pipeline, you only need to provide the URI specifying that model. And we have this now for TensorFlow Hub. And I've got an example here. This is, again, real code where you can give the URI and your pipeline can instantiate the handler only given that URI. And then you can execute inference. And I'm going to show you that it's true with another demo. So here we're using that TensorFlow Hub model handler. We have our model URI that we can find on the TensorFlow page. We are going to use an image classifier model for this demonstration. So instead of doing all of our pre-processing in a pre-processing function, we just have a local image. We do our pre-processing because we're only going to do one sample. And then show that the pipeline only needs the model handler, which is defined simply with that URI. Then the post-processor. And so here we have to do you know, our loading the labels so that we can translate from the output of the model back into English text. So we have our pipeline, which is simply create the P collection or read the input, perform the inference with that model handler. Again, a model handler we could define in a single line, then post-process and print the output. And I'm going to see, I pre-run it because I never trust the live demo to actually work. But you can see here very quickly with the model already downloaded, I can get the inference and I don't know if I would call that a tiger cat, but again, we, we deal with the models we can fit in our CoLab instance. But I think this really showcases the power of simplicity. When I want to do something, I never want to write a large amount of boilerplate code. And if someone else has a model that achieves my ends, I would love to be able to use it that easily. Now, back to our slide. So let's talk about some of the other things that Run Inference provides that have been added since the last Beam Summit. We have these pre-processing and post-processing functions that are needed for almost any model. You always have to get your data into a standard format. So we decided, what if we could make that part of your Run Inference specification? 
So now you can have your run inference, your model handler with its pre-processing and post-processing functions. Of course, here they're defined as lambdas, but they could just as well be defined elsewhere in your file. So this gives you the ability to write clean code that clearly shows what is applied to your input before and after inference. In addition, we know that our code doesn't always work. Sometimes the inference call will fail or throw an exception. So we've added an ability to do error handling with run inference as well. Here you can pass in an additional uh, P collection to store a dead letter queue or an exception queue. This allows you to then see what failed, not just in inference, but specifically what failed in pre-processing, inference, or post-processing. This gives you tremendous insight into what you were not able to process and can lead to you instantiating a retry loop or discovering that <clears throat> there are some inputs that your model doesn't handle well. Another thing we've added is for that streaming real-time use case. It's well known that when you deploy a model to perform inference on streaming data, your data is expected to drift and your model performance, if you use the same model, is expected to decline over time. So what we've decided to implement here, <clears throat> excuse me, is the ability to, in a streaming pipeline, two different ways, update your model while the pipeline is running. So you can, in an offline process, train and evaluate an updated model, and then you can either write it to a GCS bucket, or you can send an event and then say, here is where the location of the new updated model is. This allows you to have a improved model with zero downtime. Another thing that we've implemented is the ability to ensure your model is loaded as a singleton. And that even in a multi-process context, you're able to call one model instead of each process believing it needs to load or evict a model, say, from your GPU or CPU. So this provides large efficiency gains, especially when you're using something like a GPU for your inference. Finally, we think about how Beam can map to real-life business processes. So here we have the idea of a business process. Say this is you trying to replace humans in your phone tree. You get someone speaking. You need to take that speech, turn it into text, understand what they're saying. You want to check their sentiment analysis to see if this program is making people angrier than your customer service reps were. While you're understanding that, you also want to say, are they asking a question that is more about what product would help me? Or are they complaining more about a product that doesn't work? Then you would go either to a product recommender model or into a support recommender model. Finally, the output of that is text. You need to talk to the other person on the, the phone line. You've got to transform it back to speech. This is a very complex workflow, but a realistic one. And the key point for Beam here is that all of these arrows point one way. And this maps, therefore, perfectly to a Beam DAG. That DAG has two different things that we can do with models. One is branching. We can take that one input and then send it to two different models for two different purposes. For example, sentiment analysis and a recommender. We can also have sequential models. And this is very, very common, where we want to do that speech to text, some sort of language processing, and then text back to speech. So we need to stack our models. And Beam is a great fit for this as well. Finally, we were talking about what we've got now and we would like to now turn to what we wish to do in the future. One simple and obvious thing is, 
as we've got our TensorFlow Hub model handler, we want to add a Hugging Face model handler that works as cleanly and as easily so that your code can be even shorter and simpler. Another use case is actually calling a remote endpoint for inference. This is obviously a different ball of wax than local inference because we have to consider things like throttling, error handling, and retries. We're first implementing this for Vertex AI on Google Cloud as the endpoint. But we expect once we've solved some of these problems, we will soon extend this to other endpoint-based inference models. But what about beyond inference? I have been thinking a lot about this. And I know that there's this common paradigm for machine learning inference. And in this case, this is, say, uh, either batch or streaming. Both would be appropriate, but let's think of it in a streaming context. Kind of the workflow is you start with a question, explore your data, extract features, and then say, well, can this data answer my question? If yes, you may train an ML model to do that. No, get new data, try again, give up. Once you have that model, you need to evaluate it to make sure that it performs well on your data set. If it does, you're going to serve it. Now this is generating value. Customers are thrilled, delighted. But as we said before in our streaming model updates, they're probably less delighted with time unless you update your model. So there's a process where while serving that model, you may want to fork, especially if your interactions give you ground truth data as output. I offer customers choices and they pick one. Wow, I now have more training data coming in for free with my pipeline. I can write that into another storage source. And then as a separate loop, I can evaluate my model against that historical data. I can train an updated model. I can fine tune with that recent historical data and then compare an A-B test replaying data from the past. Finally, if the new model is better, I update it and serve it back into my pipeline. This process is also all arrows pointing one way. The cycle is in where we serve the model and we've already shown that updating that model is something we can do easily in a Beam pipeline by publishing an event or writing the model to a specific, a specific location. So that means we can start thinking, can we make this loop as easy as run inference? Can we use tools and libraries and Beam's functioning to make this as easy as passing in parameters for storage and your evaluation criteria. This is obviously tremendously valuable and at least moderately difficult, but it's something that we have our sights set on for the future. Now, back to Reza. Thank you very much, Gary. So, um, Again, as with inference, I've been putting together kind of some requirements. And by the way, anything on the inference side, if you played with it uh, and it's missing, feel free to come and shout at me at some point. I will record them and we'll try and get those in. Uh, we've been thinking about this sort of like training cycle and how we can help Beam in that space. Obviously, it's around the pre-processing of data as you're getting it prepared for training. And there are common functions that need to be implemented. And these are the functions that we think, again, similar to our inference, we can encapsulate within a single transform and allow users to provide configuration. The start of this is, is ML transform. Um, and uh, this is a work in progress. So this, the, the, start, the, the things here may change. But the pattern is going to be very similar uh, to run inference. So ML transform is the encapsulating uh, transformation. Underneath it, you will pass in configuration. In this particular case, there's a couple of functions that are commonly used in preparing data, for example, compute and apply vocabulary. 
The idea again being that just by providing the configuration, we're removing the need for coding to be done. The hope we have with this as well is that, you know, when the data scientists are building the work that they need to do, they pass that notebook to the data engineer. The data engineer can just start making use of the functions that data scientist has, put them into this transform and not have to worry about all the things like scale, etc., that we will um, take care of. So uh, outside of ML transform, um, you know, we're hoping there's going to be other transformations that we can build that encapsulate this use case, but also looking to the community to add ideas. So please raise feature requests, et cetera, uh, within Beam um, and even contribute uh, to that. And with that, questions.